and just tell us everything she's at home. Special Nancy, that's probably a good thing she's not here because Nancy did just bring the baby and just tell us. The official one? The Master Mason. Whoa, I don't know if that's the official one. You don't one. come any, you know, you don't get any higher on the tree than that. <laughs> that's a little concerning, I don't know. <laughs> it was rummy sale. I got it for a nickel so I could have another King James. There you go. I'll probably just cut that cover off of the pin snips. <laughs> Throw that in the street just zone. Put a sticker over it or something. <laughs> Sharpie it in. All right, good morning, everybody. If you want to make your way in here uh, for our adult, adult Bible class or find your uh, classroom where you want to hang out, maybe you want to be in the reader's class. I don't know. That's up to you. Um, but we are going to be <coughs> tackling a new topic here in the forum here in just a minute. Whoa. <coughs> 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 Made it this whole time. <laughs> Can't. She she said I'm going to come in, press the button because I have to go to other class. So she did it. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. A little bit of a light crowd this morning, but that's all right. Um. Last week, we kind of finished up our time of talking about the Lord's Supper, and, you know, I think that's something we could talk about for a long time, and I think it's, uh, like we talked about, something we take often, and so I think it should be a continual discussion. So, just because we finished it in the forum doesn't mean that talking about the Lord's Supper is over. I invite you to continue at least thinking about it. Um, but I said that we would be tackling kind of a new section of the forum, and I said that we'll be looking at the thou shall nots. And I say that kind of in jest because I'm not going to go uh, Old Testament, Ten Commandments on you. But rather I want to look at, oh, I was trying to think how I'm going to word this. Uh, maybe the modern church thou shall nots. Does that make sense to you guys? No. So what are those things that in the church today are given and stated as uh, thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that. Are you talking scripturally or traditionally? Yes, it can be both, because if we get a mix of both, we can uh, look at the scripture. Well, then throw dancing on the Okay, list. cool. We already got one that I have. Cool. All right. Dancing. <laughs> so, Terry's on the right mindset. This is kind of where I was going, but I wanted to see where you guys uh, came up with some. Dancing. Instrumental worship. Okay. Jordan's not being shy. I'm going to abbreviate instrumental. Uh, you can throw smoking and gambling on there. Okay. I'm gonna... <coughs> I put Seven. gambling. Seven um, <laughs> well, hey. Um. Smoking, that's an interesting one I didn't really think about, but we can maybe break it up into a different one. Smoking. Yeah, so you put the G on there. It's just smoking. Smoking. Here, we'll abbreviate it. Smoking. <laughs> there, you go. Uh, there you go. What are some other ones? Uh, like, you, like you said, it could be traditional, it could be scriptural. Um, if we have a mix of both, it's a good thing to explore. In the modern church, and you can even go outside of the Church of Christ or... Uh, within the church of Christ, whatever you're comfortable with. One that Courtney made me think about, which I don't because I didn't grow up in the South, is uh, it's women. Oh, yeah. Mixed bathing yeah, is mixed. what they call Right. Uh -huh. I actually think I put what I put on here. Oh, swimming together is what I put. It mixed swimming is how they had it in all the tracks and stuff. Mixed bathing is uh, what I Well, it's that like sounds even weirder. <laughs> That's like some different cultures than American cultures. Um, <coughs> ah, there you go. There's one. How about polygamy? <laughs> okay, Terry, you're not allowed to say any more. <laughs> Poly. Go. Poly. Uh? G-A-M-A. 
Eight in between there? Doesn't seem right. Between G and G, yeah, G A and A. Okay, there we go. It doesn't. We know what it is. Too many than you need. Um, <laughs> what else? I mean, there can be some kind of these ones that are a little more firm um, that I think none of us would recommend. We could even put like drug use on there. I mean, obviously, you shouldn't use drugs. There's uh, a lot of misinformation on the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. You know, a lot of, a lot of things that are not given to powers of us. You know, Disciple-like abilities. Yeah. I'm thinking like, you know, uh, like Pentecostal. Right. Um, I might put a little asterisk on this one. We did spend some time talking about the Holy Spirit kind of at the beginning of the forum. If you think, I mean, we could talk about the Holy Spirit forever, so maybe I shouldn't open that up. But if you think of like a specific track, you're kind of going with. Um, How about the gifts? Of the yeah, the yeah. miraculous yeah. Yeah. gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was thinking like spirit healers. Yeah. Gifts last actions is what I'll put. Um, Ooh, that means you could put snakes up there too. How about I'll put uh, that in the uh, uh, the screen. Uh, there was a big thing eighty or a hundred years ago about TV and movies. Should Christian watch Christians okay. watch? Uh, so let's put that as entertainment. Things I, that are bigger yeah. than, or you know, more realistic than print. I guess. Ooh, Harry and then Potter. you could also put the military. Are Christians supposed to be in the military? Oh man. Okay, we might take all the time until Christmas on this one. All right, military. And politics. <laughs> you can kind of run that. Oh, okay, politics. We already got that in Hebrews a little bit, but we can maybe recap. That's a good one, though, Jerry. It is. He's asking for the... And um, then... So the, uh, some of the obvious ones, um, you could just put infidelity for all the, like, adultery, fornication, that whole group. Okay. Sexual, sexual sins. Sexual sins. I put... For that one, I put living together, specific, sick, A -L. A -L. Um The Greek word uh, for fornication is a broad sweeping word that means all sexual sins, all illicit sexual activities. Yeah. All right. What else? Uh, another, like, obvious one that I think is a good one to stand on, but it should be talked about more, is abortion. Um, start getting low here. And with drug use, you could put drinking, or that could be an entirely separate. Oh, wow. Let's you know? put it right here at the top. Okay. It's like I almost prepared something about that today. Drinking. I thank you for saying it, because I was about to forget about it, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and then also, you know, you could put with sexual sins here, maybe in between. Um, divorce is also a good topic. It is a thou shall not, obviously, right? And I'm not saying it is or isn't. That's what we have this class time for. It's just uh, these are the topics that we prominently say, thou shall not, you shall not be involved in this. Do you have any more that I didn't get up here? Multiple times. Uh, not be here every Sunday. Oh, oh yes, right. attendance. 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 Yeah. Thou shalt not teach error. All right. False doctrine. Oh, yeah, that, that's a really good word there because that can open a lot of things, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the one cup slash uh, no kitchens. <laughs> all right, so we, I put that down. I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm going to group it all together, but they would call themselves institutionalists, right? Anti-institutionalists. Or anti, yeah, anti would be the movement there. But there's like 12 different flavors of that. You need about three blackboards to get all of their little <laughs> things on them. And that's, uh, I can't remember who I was talking to. I don't know if it was in here or with Courtney or where we we're at, but one thing I didn't realize until going down to Lubbock was that, you know, this non-institutionalist, this anti, the ultra-conservative movement, there's like a dozen or more different flavors of that, right? And so we, we might spend some time talking about that. Um, you know, there's the one cuppers, there's the no kitchens, there's the no preachers, there's the no Bible class, and those can all be different churches. <laughs> and I thought, oh, there's just normal and then that one, but there's not. You know, because I didn't grow up in a place where you can have a church every other block. So that was new to me. Terry? Bible versions. Okay. That's a big thing. <laughs> I mean, I, put, I, did a, uh, I didn't put it on my list because um, I just gave the quick little history. I'm like, hopefully people are content with that. <laughs> Probably not. I'm, I'm talking about 
churches where you're asked to leave if you're not carrying a KJV. Well, that's what Paul preached from, so. <laughs> Dennis. What's interesting about that list is, you know, some of those things are actually directly so many words in the Bible, mm -hmm. in plain language, and the others we get by inference from extending the idea of something. And I'll even take you another step. Some of them we just make up. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, there's kind of the spectrum of um, absolutely the Bible talks about this. The Bible tells us what to do. Absolutely. The Bible makes us think about what we should do with this. And then, well, the Bible doesn't talk about it. So let's just say what we need to do, right? Um, speak into the silence a little bit. Dennis likes to take us down that road sometimes. We're silent where the Bible is silent, except for when we're not, right? So. Would that get you into priests, nuns, and youths? What would I write this down as? Uh, li liturgy? No, it's liturgy. What do you call that? Incense and uh, popes. And, I mean, what do you call all of that? Uh, professional religion is what I'm going to put. And then I'll wonder what in the world that means. Churchianity? Hierarchy. Hierarchy. Anyway, if I can remember in however long it takes us to get to that one, uh, I'll, I'll ca tackle that. You said women's dress, women's so, dress codes. Dress code. And I also thought about putting that one down, but we did talk about modesty a little bit. Oh, okay. We'll but um, if I eliminate a couple of these, it, we have a, a ton. So, But uh, yeah, I, I, that one's, I think of that one a lot, but we did talk about <laughs> modesty a little bit, you know? All right. So, if you come up with another one, you feel free to text me. Let me know. Did you have another one, Jordan? I'm looking at. You, well, you can. We're just writing it on the board today. That's all we're doing. But the modern church, thou shall not. It's biblical. It, it's kind of on a spectrum, and so we'll talk about them on the spectrum. You know. Um, we and I'm not going to point because that's what the purpose of this class the is. Middle but of it is good. yes, did you put music? Yeah, yeah musical music. instruments, well, instrumental worship, mic even microphones. Oh, Carol. My goodness. All, all right. right. Technology. Yeah. We'll just group it all together. There you go. Oh, I got one for you. Shape notes. Where have I yeah. put that? The dancing. Dog is that connected to the instrument? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I don't know where to put that. I think the reason we're not we're not talking about that today, but I I would think the reason that one would be brought up would be it's from the instrument, right? All right. So when it comes to those modern thou shall nots, um, like Dennis was saying, we're going to have some that are, you know, instructed straight from Scripture. Some that we can kind of infer what, what God wants us to do through his scripture. And some that just aren't there. And so sometimes we go the opposite side of that and we make a rule out of something that isn't there. But here's what I was thinking about. When we talk about modern church, thou shall not. How we've historically taught what you should not do is we say, do not press the button. Do not press the button. Do not Drink, dance, gamble, smoke, worship with the instrument. I'm not going to talk about that one. Do not divorce or abort or use drugs or have multiple wives or go swimming with women if you're a man, right? Traditionally, that's, you know, thou shall not, do not press the button. And so I've already had multiple comments about it today. What happens when you tell somebody not to press the button? Why? Because there's reason. Why, why are you telling me not to do why? it? There's got to be a reason that I yeah. can't do it, so i got to do it to find out why I shouldn't do it. Yes. It's an inborn <laughs> arrogance in us not to want to obey somebody else's rule. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Courtney? Yeah, and not understanding why not. Yes. You know? yeah. What's that? In the garden. In the garden, right. Uh, that's exactly, that's a great point, right? In the garden, thou shalt not take the fruit. One rule. One rule. 
But yet the human nature of it all was taking the fruit, pressing the button. I don't think it was, though, because humans were in the garden without eating the fruit. Oh, it was the Satan that said, go ahead and do it. The humans were there prior to the Satan saying, do so, it. This was kind of Courtney's so in my conversation. They, never existed, they may have never eaten. So don't let me get off on that, okay? You put in that sign on that dot, tempted us. <laughs> it, well, and when Courtney and I were having this, Jen's like, nah, I knew something was about that. When Courtney and I were having this conversation the other day, we the kind of what started it is, um, you know, Adam and Eve had the first sin, but yet Satan was there tempting them. That wasn't sin. And so kind of the, the conclusion that I said, you know, Satan was fallen. But yet humans are the one that are plagued by sin. But either way, whether you are tempted because of the dark works of Satan around you, or you're tempted by your human nature, or you're just curious because now there's a sign and I want to press the button. I think putting up a sign and a big button or saying thou shall not and not explaining it is a very detrimental thing to do if you want to have true followers of Christ. If you really want to improve people's lives, most of these topics on here are things you should help them work through, help them avoid. But if you really want to help people's lives, you're going to teach them why they're going to be helpful to their lives. Mm -hmm. You're not just going to say, thou shalt not press the button. Mm -hmm. Terry? A lot of places used to put, like, do not open the door type signs or emergency exit only. And now you see the signs that say emergency exit only, alarm will sound when you open the door. They give a consequence. They, they've given a consequence, but they've also given an explanation. That's true. Of the fact that it's an emer instead of just saying do not go, you know, don't open the, door, open the door, they've given them an explanation and a consequence. At the courthouse. Yeah, so. absolutely. So I think we're going to have plenty of, uh, plenty of topics to talk about over the next weeks, and we might get to talk about this first one for a couple of weeks since we've had this introduction. But one of the very first ones I put on this list that often is a do not press the button. It is thou shall not drink, right? Guilty. <laughs> guilty of saying that is what you're saying. No, I'm guilty of drinking. Okay, well. Alcohol. <laughs> confession time, I guess, right? All right, <laughs> so we'll get to talk about that for a second. Um, who else here is guilty of drinking alcohol? Let's see. <laughs> yeah, a multiple. Did you have a comment, Jordan, before I, I was put you on the spot? <laughs> That's such an unteach un area in the church. It is. And I mean, it says, what is it, Timothy Paul says, you know, you, you, can't, you can't be given too much wine. Yeah. And then an elder not given too wine. And then, you know, just that whole, my wife's grandfather. Yeah. Well, you know they were drinking wine. Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right, Courtney. Um, I don't drink, yet I'm drinking, guilty of drinking alcohol because I've had vanilla pudding. I've had cough syrup. I've had sourdough bread. There's all kombucha. I've had kombucha. There's small alcoholic content. Just saying. Just saying. Huh. So anyway, oh, Dennis, go for it. I, I, I don't mean to distract you. You're good. I want to get right back to this, this one. But a, a second ago on the pressing the button deal, in our, uh, our craving to do what we're told not to, there's a lot of places in the Bible, and right now I can't even think of a one, but where God simply says don't. Mm -hmm. But there's... A whole lot, and I think probably a lot more percentage-wise, that we're going to say don't because, and we're yes. blessed when he gives us that because, because then we can understand the thing. Uh, the other, the first one I would call, we obey it out of sheer, either the fear of God or blind faith. Yeah. And the next one we obey, the one with a reason or two, we obey because it's a reasoned prohibition. Yeah. And it appeals to our sense of reason and understanding. However, we as saints, whether back in the days of Moses or now or Adam, we got to do the thou shalt not no matter what reason there is or ain't. Another kind of a human trait, I guess you might say. So let me, let me just throw this out there before we start diving into the scripture. When you take the topic of drinking, alcohol, that's what we're talking about, right? Not coffee or water. But when you take that topic, is it one of those topics that is given black and white Yes or no? Or is it one of those topics that's given with a little more explanation? More explanation. More explanation? Why do you think that? Well, uh, 
a little devil's advocate. I mean, being married to an alcoholic, my I wish he would never, ever drink ever again. Yeah. Um, none. But somebody who, like me, I can have a drink and go months and months without ever having another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it's not something that, but I wouldn't want to drink, have a drink in front of my son. Because you know him to be tempted. Okay. But, so, there, I wish, you know, there's some, some people that should not ever drink because they can't control themselves. I got that in here. Don't worry, we'll get there. But as an example, if you look at when um, Samson was conceived, mm -hmm. the angel told Manoah's wife to abstain from drinking alcohol, telling her that not to stop drinking just while you're pregnant. Yeah. Uh, and then she could go on and drink some more. Jen's really, she's got, that's a great answer. Dennis, did you have another one? The, the, uh, that's, that's just one. The, the Bible, Old and New Testament, both give lots of reasons uh, why drunkenness is troublesome. Dennis is already getting us there to the word. Okay, Courtney? Alcohol has many benefits from mm -hmm. medicinal to, I mean, when used in moderation, it's like comfort for hard days. You know? yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think our friend Cameron got in trouble, but in class at Bible school, Christian school, he said, they were talking about Old Testament, God took away the wine to punish the Israelites, and he said, does that mean that wine is a gift from God? <laughs> <laughs> he got in trouble, but, <laughs> but I think you didn't it get is that a gift from God yeah. when used correctly. Nancy, did you have another thing there? Oh, I was just thinking, I've watched some of those old Western movies, and when they're doing operations, they sit there with the whiskey bottle. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, I can't even. <laughs> so to numb the operation. Absolutely. I mean, first Corinthians, you know, we, we know that the first century church was drinking. And getting drunk. And, and, and getting they were, Paul specifically addresses that first Corinthians and in Ephesians. Yeah. So kind of my broad survey of that, the reason I, I wanted us to think about that is, I think, yes, I think this is a topic where the Bible um, gives reasoning, right? It doesn't just say, no, yes, maybe. It says, uh, just if you look, you take a look at the Bible as a whole, Old Testament, New Testament, you guys would go in there, and I like it, um, there is lots of reason to be not given to much wine or to take wine or whatever. Wine is the biblical term for alcohol. Um, and so I think it is one of these topics that is given with reasoning, <clears throat> given with some thought behind it. But yet, and I'm, I'm not harping on our history, but yet our, in our history, we usually have had it presented to us as if there is a Bible verse that says, thou shall not let a single drop of alcohol pass from the lips to the mouth, you know, whatever. Um, and historically, we have taught it that way, but there's a lot of reasoning within the scriptures. So why don't we reason together? <laughs> That's kind of my thought process on most of these topics. Why don't we reason together? I think a lot of it is, or at least, there are people that are afraid to address those controversial issues. I've learned that, especially in instrumental worship. Yeah. I've had people tell me that they've never heard it explained the way that I would say it and explain it. Because it's never taught. Yeah. No one ever teaches why. Yeah, it's never tossed up here, it is sometimes. <laughs> You'll find we might not be that group, which is good. We're trying really hard. Nancy? Well, and then we, uh, being Church of Christ my whole life, my the explanation was the first would want to be, it's most like the first century church. Mm -hmm. And they didn't use instruments. That's why we don't need to use instruments. Mm -hmm. But that was their explanation. Yeah, that's another topic, though, you guys. You've got to stick to what we're working with. Okay. I was not drinking. Drinking. <laughs> Drinking. If you look at the wisdom and the teaching and the understanding of the scripture, you can find a lot, right? And I'm, I'm just going to scratch the surface. Um, book of Proverbs, chapter 20, and I'm going to look at chapter 23 as well. Proverbs is kind of that wisdom book, right? If, you, if you're trying to figure out how to get through something in life, there's probably a line or two in Proverbs that would give you some healthy advice. And, and that, um, when we taught Financial Peace University, you know, even money issues are in Proverbs. Even drinking is in Proverbs. So Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is like a mocker. Strong drink a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. I mean, a powerful verse just to start us off with here in Proverbs 20, verse 1. But what's being said about alcohol there? It'll wreck you. Proverbs what? 
20 verse 1 is where I was right there. What did you say, Jordan? It says, don't be led astray. Don't be led astray. Um, I'll link the two together here on, on what is being written here. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, do not be led astray. Alcohol can be wicked, right? It can be tough, it can be rowdy, it can be mocking and brawling. Don't let it take you away, that is unwise. And we look at even our modern context of alcohol. I think a brawler and a mocker is kind of a good word for what alcohol can cause, right? It's kind of actually almost humorous because we see people uh, who are drunk becoming brawlers and mockers, which is kind of funny. So the wisdom, the wiseness from the writer of Proverbs here is saying what? Be careful with alcohol. It can lead you astray, right? It can lead you astray. That's some wisdom. That's some uh, talking about it, if you will. Um, Proverbs 23 also talks about wisdom when it comes to drinking as well. Probably starting here. Oh. Let's start in verse 20. And then we'll hop down a little bit here. Proverbs 23, verse 20, just looking at the wisdom of life when it comes to alcohol. Verse 19 says, be wise and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. Terry's reading the second half of the verse. I can tell it. What is that, 19 what? That is 2320. That's something that we didn't put up there. And it's a very Southern thing. And I'm sorry to pick on the Southern churches, but that's the ones I ran into a lot with the Bible-thumping preacher who gets up there and talks about drinking and dancing and smoking and is 100 pounds overweight. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So. Exactly. And laughing about it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that one's close to my heart, and we've talked about that a little bit before. But the reason that Terry's bringing this up is not because she has an opinion, but the fact she just read about wisdom in the Scripture, right? Proverbs 23, 20, we had the drunkard in the same sentence as the glutton. Interesting, right? Jen, did you have a comment there? What about marriage? Thou what? shalt not marriage. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, well, it says... We don't practice that one very if, much. Yeah, it says, if you're marriage. married... You're not sinning. If you decide to get married, you're not sinning. But he says, to spare you the pain, don't get married. Um, and I'm, what I meant by the one that he put up there is professional religion. You know, priests and nuns and all of that oh, kind of stuff. Exactly. You know, you yeah. Know. I'm going to put I'm gonna put Paul's just so... I think celibacy... Cel... Uh? I, I it's, it's just like celebrate, only opposite. A, is this right? I'm celebrating. I know what it means. That's not right at all, but whatever. Um, celibate. Okay, we're good. Um, that's another good topic, right? But I'm trying to keep us on trying to keep us on drinking, guys. Okay. But I think I think Terry's got a good point here. In the same uh, piece of wisdom, we have the drunkard and the glutton in the same sentence. Why? Why are those unwise things to follow down the path? In this proverb, exactly. My, my wife's grandfather always said, uh, too much of a good thing. Too much of one thing. As good as one thing is always. Yeah. It destroys lives. That's kind of the focus. Mm -hmm. Larry? Lack of self-control. Lack of self-control. Courtney? No, skip me. No. no. Nancy? It destroys lives. My first yeah. husband was an alcoholic. He it was horrible. It was horrible competing with the bottle. Yeah. He, he just, it's destroyed our marriage. It destroyed my son Brandon's uh, uh, having his dad and his wife. And he's still angry about it to this day. I mean, it's not alcohol. He, in the text, he said he's 120 days sober. So hopefully he got a lick in his 50s. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I think, the, I think these two verses that we read here in Proverbs already uh, speak into that, right? Because for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, their slumber will clothe them with rags. What, what kind of imagery is given to us? It's, it's going to take everything from them. My ex-husband was homeless yeah. many, many, many times living on the streets. And again, on to Terry's point, I'm glad we put it up there because I wanted to. But on to Terry's point, we don't usually think that about gluttony, but we do think that about drunkenness. 
We see it happen in our culture, right? So it'll take away everything and you'll be left with nothing. You'll be left homeless. You'll be left sleeping with the rags and in poverty. All right. Let's look at verse 30. Oh, Dennis, did you have something there? I'm sorry. Okay, don't lose verse 30 there. Okay. But uh, this one preacher I know, he got up in front of the church just to rant and rave. Yeah, he was from Tennessee. <laughs> and he was raging about alcohol, and he put in some pretty cute little human, in his mind, logical arguments. And he said, well, I got a friend that says, takes takes uh, him a six pack and a half to get drunk. And I told him, well, and he said, so can I drink one can? And he says, well, then I'd be one tenth drunk, wouldn't I? And, and, uh, uh, and, and, he, and he thought that was real cute. But yep. just, I love to eat. Now, one big plate of food's nice. Uh, it, uh, is three gluttony? Yeah, Virgil, uh, three is gluttony. And, uh, so you better uh, not be eating. Your gluttony, so is one plate, you're one third gluttony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he didn't see, he couldn't follow the math, his own math there. And that's what Courtney was getting on to. And Courtney, uh, Courtney's growing up shines through sometimes. But, you know, that logic really falls apart when you start, well, what is alcohol? And, and you go down, kombucha, okay, that's pretty alcoholic, you know, it's, as far as not alcohol, alcohol goes, right? Cough syrup, you go down that road, you, you can keep going further and further. You go vanilla, yeah, that's alcoholic. You go, you go to uh, bread. Bread has fermented the yeast, and it is actually alcoholic. To a degree, right? So are you one one hundredth of a drunk? Yeah. See, and the, the logic kind of does fall apart on that. But anyway, back to your verse. Then. But I'm just, I'll, I'll get us there, because we're going to have two weeks on this, no doubt. But I think there is wisdom in being cautious with alcohol, and I think Proverbs shares that. Um, 20, verse 30. Again, 23, verse 30, sorry. We were in 20, but now we're in 23. 23, verse 30. <clears throat> Woe to those who tarry long over wine, those who go and try mixed wine. Do not look at the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Which one is that? That is Proverbs 23, starting there in verse 20. It's in the woe, woe to section. <laughs> Well. That is about as close to an abstinence one as I've seen. Yep. Abstinence. So I, let's just bring the principle out of it, though, with the wisdom of it. What is this saying about wine or alcohol in a, in a wisdom sense? It bites sometimes, right? I think that's kind of exactly how it ends. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings. last line of 23 is when will I wake up so I can find another drink. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're talking about drinking. I think, think you're talking about, about being addicted. Sure. Uh, let's, we can go ahead and read through the end of the chapter there. Uh, so I ended at 32. Let's read 33 through 35. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you say, but it was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wake? So I must have another drink. So I think Terry's kind of right here, um, looking at these differences in drinking, drunkenness, and then this is like an addictive drunkenness, right? So let's go ahead and just pause there for a second. This might be kind of where we end up starting next week. But on to Dennis's comment, is there a difference when it comes to scripture between drinking and drunkenness? Yeah. 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 What's that? Timothy. <laughs> Timothy. I would say, actually, unless you can prove me wrong, all of our New Testament references will be talking about drunkenness. And, and in, a, in a negative light of, of you should be careful is about drunkenness. We can also go with Timothy and on the positive side of things, have a drink, right? And we'll get there eventually. Um, so I think it's important for us to identify that there is scripturally a difference between a drink and drunkenness. Or, you know, like here, actually Proverbs 23 does a very good job of describing um, 
the differences in wine, you know, this is describing a very specific wine that must have been the good wine, if you want to use that word, right, Dave? I was just going to say, uh, it's very, very, very common analogy used, in, uh, not necessarily just in the South, but I've heard it mostly there, is the approaching uh, the difference between the drinkiness and drunkenness. Mm -hmm. You can't be just a little bit pregnant. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you have one good. drink, you know, you're, you're, you're fully drunk. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that a lot too. And then the road that that goes down, because if you, if you think about it too much, you'll start to realize that there's going to be some problems if we're reading about Jesus and we're saying you can't have one drink, you're fully drunk, right? Because Jesus' first miracle was turning water to wine. The culture drank wine. Um, Jesus shared wine at the Lord's Supper. And so if you start to think that way, then we have some other problems we have to solve as if they're not already solved in the scripture yeah. for us, right? So, therefore, Jesus on that first miracle, he made new wine. So that means that he, you know, that good wine was actually just grape juice. But I would disagree with that pretty deeply theologically because the interaction he has with the um, master of the feast says, you waited to bring the good wine till now, but usually people wait till everybody has drunk all the other stuff, you know, or usually the opposite way, sorry. They bring out the good wine first, get everybody good and drunk, bring them the bad stuff, right? But you've done the opposite. Well, how, obviously the context there was alcoholic wine if people are drunk, you know? It's like, I, I can't connect the two there, right? Or, um, yeah, you, you have to jump through a lot of different things there if you want to prove that you shouldn't have any alcohol ever because Jesus did. <laughs> we might talk about this next week, but Welch, Mr. Welch? I wasn't going to talk about it. Charles Welch was not born until 1893 or something. And so therefore there was no way to keep it from fermenting. So no matter no matter how new it was, it immediately begins to ferment a little microscopically. So anyway. So well, 1893 when Charles E. Welch, good job Courtney, and his son invented the pasteurization process of grape so that was like right before, you know, where we can start remembering, right? <laughs> but I mean, pretty new. Late 1800s, right around the turn of the century. Dennis, we're off on some things. I had a good friend of mine named Chucky Welch, and he died of alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, Great grandpa didn't but, do a good job. <laughs> but no, it's, it's kind of, I think people are straining at a gnat, uh, working real hard into the face of scripture on that trying to make those that uh, at that feast uh, just great juice because if you look up the word Perkins or those conditions it's like 120 gallons mm -hmm. and the big jar said they've run out so they've already had some and he's going to make that much more great juice this must have been a huge feast if it took that much and and, and also I think God gave the fermentation process so man would be able to use the, the, the juice of the, the different fruits for all the year till next harvest yeah. time. Yeah. And, the, and the alcohol allows that to happen. They had that way before they had paraffin and canning jars right. and all that. And I'll go, uh, I'm, I know we have lots of comments on this. I'll go hang out there for a second just from a practicality standpoint, like Dennis is getting to. Um, how, how would it stay grape juice? How would it stay grape juice if you pressed it and put it in a jar and you didn't have, you know, refrigerators and right. good jars and like what Dennis is talking about? Um, I, I just don't see a practical way how in the Middle East you're going to keep grape juice fresh and not ferment it. So instead you would go the other way and ferment it so you could use it for a long time. And so that's kind of my logical thinking process on that because that's an, another piece of the, the Welch his, history is we didn't really have refrigeration until... 1913 or something very mass, right? So, in a lot of places in the world, whoever, in a lot of places in the world, it's a lot safer to drink a mild wine than it is to drink the water. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I would think culturally that would make sense there too. Have you seen? We, Courtney, I've been laughing about this a little bit. Have you seen the the bodies of water that we're talking about in scripture? It's like we're like, that's a river. <laughs> 
huh? Oh, that's a body. It's like, we're kind of in the desert here, the high mountain desert, basically. And uh, it's like, eh, that, that's what you're washing in, huh? Interesting. Body's good work and no camel floats by. <laughs> Nancy Fortney. Well, I just think it doesn't, uh, that that uh, ferment uh, helps kill parasites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're going on some practical reasons. Courtney and then Dennis. Okay. My turn after. I was reading a book about plants of the Rocky Mountains, and I kept seeing these common names, nightshade, uh, I don't know, but plants were like, oh, you don't eat those. Those berries are poisonous. And then under it, it says, Native Americans use this to cure this disease, this disease, this ailment, this. And it's kind of confusing, like, this is poison, but it cures these. And we know Satan can't create. He's not a creator. God is a creator. Satan can twist it and use it bad. And mm. I think alcohol is just another example of that. Mm. Created by God for a specific purpose. That can be twisted like that. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Dennis, did you have another comment? You there? know, on that preservation thing, just a kind of a technical note. When when uh, uh, sugars ferment, the, the fermentation is started by the yeasts in the plant, uh, they will ferment and they will go one of two ways. They will go off and make wine, if you will with alcohol or they will turn at a certain point and become non-alcoholic in that in that case it's called vinegar mm -hmm. and we read about lots of both of them in the bible right and they're it, we really shouldn't have to talk about these sort of things that much but we do because that's usually where the thing is hanging out and one of the arguments that i heard is that just recently actually is that wine is a catch-all term right and one of the <laughs> You know, so it's wine, it's non-alcoholic wine, it's alcoholic wine, it's vinegar. And, and one of the reasons for that was, well, you know it's a catch-all term because they call the wine press the wine press, not the grape press. And I was like, yeah. And I was driving home and I'm like, no. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I call that a bread maker, but I don't put bread into it. I put dough and yeast into it and then I take it out and I make bread. I'm like, that doesn't mean I can't, I have to call it a dough yeast maker. I call it a bread maker. And so I was like, we really shouldn't have to argue or really dig deep into these um, detail parts, right? Because we really should just look at the scripture. But because of we have to find something that if we have one drink drunk, we have to find something we have to kind of cover that backwards again, right? So the main part that I want to get us to think about, and you can think about this all week, and see if you agree or disagree with me, but I think you do, is it's not about the drink. It's about the drunkenness. And all throughout the New Testament, even the Old Testament, even the transition period, specifically, um, you know, looking at Noah and other people like that, Old Testament, New Testament, drunkenness is the problem. And so we are encouraged and challenged not to be imbibing, if you will, with drunkenness. And so that's kind of where we'll pick up next week. Um, Jordan was already getting us there, 1 Corinthians, where we'll probably start there with drunkenness. Because um, that's, that's where the mockery starts to come. That's where the brawling starts to come. We can even see that in our context, right? And, and like we were talking about with Dennis, for many people, that is not just one beer. That is not just one drink. Or even for those in Jesus' time, I think that would be very true. If it was not one glass of wine, because what else were they drinking? <laughs> and so we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Did you guys have any more thoughts up until that point? We'll start talking about drunkenness next week. When are we going to talk about dancing? When are we going to talk about dancing? <laughs> we only got to talk about dancing. I, got a long list. I know we got a long list. I got till <laughs> January. Um, I think we need to finish talking about this next week. Okay. I got some more things to say. Uh, aside On the drink and our intoxication, and I would rather, uh, the drunkenness thing, it's interesting how far into the future for mankind the Holy Spirit seen for. I mean, this was, he was given all those don'ts way before the days of car wrecks and airplanes yeah. colliding. And uh, it's still good stuff. But then we get down on that last word down there, tech, and uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of things we're doing right now the Bible doesn't foresee in plain yep. words. Yeah, that is interesting to think about. Um, and, I mean, we're, we'll talk about that come, in the coming months. But, Jen? There's one in the Old Testament that does not apply to the New Testament, and thou shalt not 
forsake the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And in the New Testament, it's gone away with. And I was going to say, that probably will apply to uh, where, where did I put that? Right here. Top in the middle. Sabbath can be a part of that. Because that has changed. Again, just like most, most of these things can be explained by what's the point of Jesus? Well, he came to not create the law, but to create the heart change, right? And so that's on the most, that's on the most of these. Um, on, on the tech note, we're not talking about it. We're done with time, Dennis. But I, my favorite thing is whenever we start getting into the, some of those that are not talked about within Scripture, because they you know, didn't exist, we, we have a longer list of those than we realize. But we pick on a few because, you know, we've been comfortable. You know, chairs were not in the New Testament church when they were meeting in houses. And, you know, church right, church building was not electricity, was not air conditioning, Light. was not songbooks, were not the written word of God in a complete form was not. Mm -hmm. And it's like, huh. But yet the microphones are the tough part. Yeah, but so Peter lifted it. up his voice. How dare we have an amp? <laughs> How dare Jesus, yeah, Peter, Peter's thousands of people without an amp, right? <laughs> anyway, that's way down the list. We'll see if we even talk about it. All right, so next week we'll finish this conversation about drinking, and then we can move on to dancing as the second one if you want. I don't want to, but we will, okay? Um, see you guys in a few. We'll be done. <laughs> Uh -huh. I was reading a cookbook last night, and she re it's called Bacon and Beans, so it's all about the cowboys in the West, and she was talking about the fights that they had in the 1800s over coffee, the debates they had about coffee, the horrible drug that was coffee. So it's an interesting thing to well, see that, that that there's the really nothing new under the sun. We still fight about things. And I thought that one, I had never heard that in my life. But there were apparently more big battles. There were big public debates over coffee. It's almost like it's the making war. That's why I put that up there. Yeah, but I mean, I, I just thought that was amazing on the fact that they were condemning people. Because coffee was an ultimate substance. So I just think it's Stop hating on my favorite addiction. That's right. But I also, but I also wanted to tell you that, and I didn't say this, but the same thing that we do with wine and grape juice back then is what the Catholics did with the Immaculate Conception. Because it's true. Jesus is the child of the Immaculate Conception. It's Mary. And it's because they believe it's a sin. And the only way for Jesus to be born without sin is if Mary was born without sin. And they invented Immaculate but they had double, you know, like double parents had to not had to not pass the you know? When you get bored, can you help me get the board and the thing back?